Good evening, and welcome to Restored Lore, your home for old, odd, and obscure stories on YouTube. Tonight's story is Ojig Anung, or The Summer Maker. This is an Ojibwa myth, as told by Henry Rowe Schoolcraft in his Algic Researches in 1839. Schoolcraft adds some footnotes to this story, and I also think it would be helpful to briefly define some terms as we go along. Thanks to a genius idea suggested in the comments a couple weeks ago, you will hear this sound effect when there is a footnote on screen, in case you want to pause and read it. I will, however, start by reading one of the footnotes at the beginning of the story, since it adds context to the subject, and is better at the beginning than interrupting the first paragraph. So now, let's open our imaginations and begin. There is a group of stars in the Northern Hemisphere, which the Ojibwas call Ojig Anung, or the Fisher Stars. It is believed to be identical with the group of the Plough. They relate the following tale respecting it. There lived a celebrated hunter on the southern shores of Lake Superior, who was considered a Manitou by some, for there was nothing but what he could accomplish. He lived off the path in a wild, lonesome place with a wife whom he loved, and they were blessed with a son who had attained his thirteenth year. The hunter's name was Ojig, or the Fisher, which is the name of an expert, sprightly little animal common to the region. He was so successful in the chase that he seldom returned without bringing his wife and son a plentiful supply of venison or other dainties of the woods. As hunting formed his constant occupation, his son began early to emulate his father in the same employment, and would take his bow and arrows and exert his skill in trying to kill birds and squirrels. The greatest impediment he met with was the coldness and severity of the climate. He often returned home, his little fingers benumbed with cold, and crying with vexation at his disappointment. Days and months and years passed away, but still the perpetual depth of snow was seen, covering the country as with a white cloak. One day, after a fruitless trial of his forest skill, the little boy was returning homeward with a heavy heart when he saw a small red squirrel gnawing at the top of a pine burr. He had approached within a proper distance to shoot when the squirrel sat up on its hind legs and thus addressed him. My grandchild... Put up your arrows and listen to what I have to tell you. The boy complied rather reluctantly when the squirrel continued. My son, I see you pass frequently with your fingers benumbed with cold and crying with vexation for not having killed any birds. Now, if you will follow my advice, we will see if you cannot accomplish your wishes. If you will strictly pursue my advice, we will have perpetual summer, and you will then have the pleasure of killing as many birds as you please, and I will have something to eat, as I am now myself on the point of starvation. Listen to me. As soon as you get home, you must commence crying. You must throw away your bow and arrows in discontent. If your mother asks you what is the matter, you must not answer her, but continue crying and sobbing. If she offers you anything to eat, you must push it away with apparent discontent and continue crying. In the evening, when your father returns from hunting, he will inquire of your mother what is the matter with you. She will answer that you came home crying and would not so much as mention the cause to her. All this while you must not leave off sobbing. At last your father will say, My son, why this unnecessary grief? Tell me the cause. You know I am a spirit, and nothing is impossible for me to perform. You must then answer him, and say that you are sorry to see the snow continually on the ground, and ask him if he could not cause it to melt, that we might have perpetual summer. Say it in a supplicating way, and tell him this is the cause of your grief. Your father will reply, it is very hard to accomplish your request, but for your sake and for my love for you, I will use my utmost endeavors. He will tell you to be still and cease crying. He will try to bring summer with all its loveliness. 
you must then be quiet and eat that which is set before you. The squirrel ceased. The boy promised obedience to his advice and departed. When he reached home, he did as he had been instructed, and all was exactly fulfilled as it had been predicted by the squirrel. Ojig told him that it was a great undertaking. He must first make a feast and invite some of his friends to accompany him on a journey. Next day he had a bear roasted whole. All who had been invited to the feast came punctually to the appointment. There were the otter, beaver, lynx, badger, and wolverine. After the feast, they arranged it among themselves to set out on the contemplated journey in three days. When the time arrived, the fisher took leave of his wife and son, as he foresaw it was for the last time. He and his companions traveled in company day after day, meeting with nothing but the ordinary incidents. On the twelfth day, they arrived at the foot of a high mountain, where they saw the tracks of some person who had recently killed an animal, which they knew by the blood that marked the way. The fisher told his friends that they ought to follow the track and see if they could not procure something to eat. They followed it for some time. At last they arrived at a lodge, which had been hidden from their view by a hollow in the mountain. Ojig told his friends to be very sedate and not to laugh on any account. The first object that they saw was a man standing at the door of the lodge, but of so deformed a shape that they could not possibly make out who or what sort of a man it could be. His head was enormously large. He had such a queer set of teeth and no arms. They wondered how he could kill animals. But the secret was soon revealed. He was a great manito. He invited them to pass the night, to which they consented. He boiled his meat in a hollow vessel made of wood and took it out of this singular kettle in some way unknown to his guests. He carefully gave each their portion to eat, but made so many odd movements that the otter could not refrain from laughing, for he is the only one who is spoken of as a jester. The manito looked at him with a terrible look, and then made a spring at him, and got on him to smother him, for that was his mode of killing animals. But the otter, when he felt him on his neck, slipped his head back and made for the door, which he passed in safety, but went out with the curse of the manito. The others passed the night, and they conversed on different subjects. The manito told the fisher that he would accomplish his object, but that it would probably cost him his life. He gave them his advice, directed them how to act, and described a certain road which they must follow, and they would thereby be led to the place of action. They set off in the morning and met their friend, the otter, shivering with cold, but Ojig had taken care to bring along some of the meat that had been given him, which he presented to his friend. They pursued their way and traveled twenty days more before they got to the place which the Manito had told them of. It was a most lofty mountain. They rested on its highest peak to fill their pipes and refresh themselves. Before smoking, they made the customary ceremony, pointing to the heavens, the four winds, the earth, and the zenith. In the meantime, speaking in a loud voice, addressed the great spirit, hoping that their object would be accomplished. They then commenced smoking. They gazed on the sky in silent admiration and astonishment, for they were on so elevated a point that it appeared to be only a short distance above their heads. After they had finished smoking, they prepared themselves. Ojig told the otter to make the first attempt to try and make a hole in the sky. He consented with a grin. He made a leap, but fell down the hill stunned by the force of his fall, and, the snow being moist and falling on his back, he slid with velocity down the side of the mountain. When he found himself at the bottom, he thought to himself, It is the last time I make such another jump so I will make the best of my way home. Then it was the turn of the beaver, who made the attempt, but fell down senseless, then of the lynx and badger, who had no better success. Now, says the fisher to the wolverine, try your skill. Your ancestors were celebrated for their activity, hardihood, and perseverance, and I depend on you for success. Now make the attempt. He did so, but also without success. 
He leapt the second time, but now they could see that the sky was giving way to their repeated attempts. Mustering strength, he made the third leap and went in. The fisher nimbly followed him. They found themselves in a beautiful plain, extending as far as the eye could reach, covered with flowers of a thousand different hues and fragrance. Here and there were clusters of tall, shady trees, separated by innumerable streams of the purest water, which wound around the courses under the cooling shades, and filled the plain with countless beautiful lakes, whose banks and bosom were covered with waterfowl, basking and sporting in the sun. The trees were alive with birds of different plumage, warbling their sweet notes, and delighted with perpetual spring. The fisher and his friend beheld very long lodges, and the celestial inhabitants amusing themselves at a distance. Words cannot express the beauty and charms of the place. The lodges were empty of inhabitants, but they saw them lined with mokoks of different sizes, filled with birds and fowl of different plumage. Ojig thought of his son, and immediately commenced cutting open the mokuks and letting out the birds, who descended in whole flocks through the opening which they had made. The warm air of those regions also rushed down through the opening and spread its genial influence over the north. When the celestial inhabitants saw the birds let loose and the warm gales descending, they raised a shout like thunder and ran for their lodges. But it was too late. Spring? Summer and autumn had gone, even perpetual summer had almost all gone, but they separated it with a blow, and only a part descended. But the ends were so mangled that, wherever it prevails among the lower inhabitants, it is always sickly. When Wolverine heard the noise, he made for the opening and safely descended. Not so the fisher. Anxious to fulfill his son's wishes, he continued to break open the mokoks. He was, at last, obliged to run also, but the opening was now closed by the inhabitants. He ran with all his might over the plains of heaven and, it would appear, took a northerly direction. He saw his pursuers so close that he had to climb the first large tree he came to. They commenced shooting at him with their arrows, but without effect, for all his body was invulnerable except the space of about an inch near the tip of his tail. At last one of the arrows hit the spot, for he had in his chase assumed the shape of the fisher after whom he was named. He looked down from the tree and saw some among his assailants with the totems of his ancestors. He claimed relationship and told them to desist, which they did only at the approach of night. He then came down to try and find an opening in the celestial plane by which he might descend to the earth, but he could find none. At last, becoming faint from the loss of blood from the wound in his tail, he laid himself down toward the north of the plain, and, stretching out his limbs, said, I have fulfilled my promise to my son, though it has cost me my life. But I die satisfied in the idea that I have done so much good, not only for him, but for my fellow beings. Hereafter, I will be a sign to the inhabitants below for ages to come who will venerate my name for having succeeded in procuring the varying seasons. They will now have from eight to ten moons without snow. He was found dead next morning, but they left him as they found him, with the arrow sticking in his tail, as it can be plainly seen at this time in the heavens. The best sentence in this story is, They commenced shooting at him with their arrows, but without effect, for all his body was invulnerable, except the space of about an inch near the tip of his tail. Not because it's actually the best written sentence in the story, but because up until that moment we didn't know he was a shapeshifter and had a tail. At least I didn't. I was surprised by it. I love mythical origin stories, and this one is extremely satisfying. It has the origins of the seasons and the flocks of colorful birds, as well as the origin of the Fisher constellation. It also connects a bit with an earlier story on the channel, uh, The Child of the Evening Star, this idea of the celestial beings above and the heaven living in a kind of paradise filled with birds. 
It's the same cosmology, actually, in both of these stories, so the similarities do make sense. I like that the otter is the jovial, playful fellow. Otters always seem to me like they have a lot of personality and they're having a good time. And it would seem to me that the lynx would be a far better jumper than a wolverine, but I can see that what we're valuing in the wolverine is persistence. This story does, of course, leave me with lots of questions. Firstly, it's a bit like Narnia, isn't it? Right? They eat deer and bear, but they also talk with and make friends with squirrels and badgers and whatnot. Also, do you think the son knows that he's sending his father to his death? Do you think the son would have acted that way if he knew his father would die in the attempt? I mean, the son is vexed that he can't shoot birds, but he's not hungry. The story makes it clear that the father provides well for his family. I think it's kind of a bummer that he dies in the end. Also, of course, it's a bit like Achilles. He's invulnerable except for that little spot on his tail from which he bleeds to death. Finally, there is the incomprehensible footnote. Uh, The text of the footnote says, no, the text of the story says, spring, summer, and autumn had gone. Even perpetual summer had almost all gone, but they separated it with a blow, and only a part descended. But the ends were so mangled that wherever it prevails among the lower inhabitants, it is always sickly. The footnote by Schoolcraft says, The idea here indicated is among the peculiar notions of these tribes and is grafted in the forms of their language, which will be pointed out in the progress of these researches. Well, that footnote doesn't really make much sense by itself, and it doesn't add any clarity to the concept. I think that what the text is trying to describe is that as they pounded to close the hole and sever summer, the ends got frayed and ragged, which is maybe why spring and autumn have such changeable weather. I mean, that idea makes sense to me and is kind of consistent with what's going on in the story, but it is really just a theory. I can't imagine what Schoolcraft is trying to explain here. My final comment on the comment is that yes, the first footnote is correct. Uh, Schoolcraft knows that the Ojibwe are also called the Chippewa, My understanding is that in the U.S. the tribe was known as the Chippewa, and they're often still referred to that way in formal or legal contexts. But the people and the language are Ojibwe, and the term Chippewa was never used in Canada at all. If you're curious a little bit more about the Fisher constellation itself, I found a nice blog post with a cute little animation of it moving through the sky, which I will link to in the comments below. Schoolcraft says it's the same as the plow, but of course I would recognize it as the Big Dipper. Finally, finally, did the sound effect uh, footnote on screen thing work for you? Please let me know in the comments below if that's an effective system or whether it was distracting. If you listen all the way to the end of the video, you get to hear me make a little confession. Tonight's confession is, yes, AI images. I've been playing around with deep AI, and I have generated some images that I think are really interesting to go along with these stories. So let's talk about it. Firstly, I think there's a huge difference between AI images that are illustrative rather than images that are photographic and bear a closer relationship to reality especially if people are making things that closely resemble real people or places, we have to be very careful and we have to be very transparent. Secondly, yes, I do wish I had a budget to hire illustrators to work on these videos. I think it would be so fun and it is the type of work that so many people would really love to do. I think it would be fantastic to have original artwork to go along with these stories and I do hope that that could happen someday, but at the moment there's just no money to invest in that way. Finally, even though I don't have a lot of time and money, I still do have to find a way to at least create compelling thumbnails for these videos. And yes, the current thumbnails are obviously kind of a big fail for me and something I really need to work on. In the meantime, this image generator is creating images that are fast and they are free and I have the legal right to use them and I find them interesting to look at. In this story, it obviously doesn't really understand how bows work and it doesn't seem to like images with more than one subject. But of course, I'm still learning how to work with this tool. And frankly, I'm really on the fence about whether I want to polish these in Photoshop and fix the messes, or just let them be kind of weird and interesting in that way. 
So I don't know if AI artwork is part of the procedure around here now, or if I'm just exploring working with it for a few videos. And of course, I am super interested to find out what you think about it. Uh, so please do let me know in the comments or drop me a note some other kind of way. Thank you so much. If you've made it all the way to the end of the video, congratulations, you're one of us. Go ahead and subscribe so you get to hear weird old stories twice a week and you don't miss anything. Please also help other people find the channel by liking this video or dropping me a comment or even sharing it with others. Thank you so, so much for all your support and I will see you in a few days.